Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your co-host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Aaron Ross, and we've got a really interesting guest on the show for us today. He's an advisor at a company called Brugal Sagemond, but he's also been placed at another company called Moby Wireless Management and really helping basically take over their revenue ops and make sure the company's building a world-class lead engine, lead gen engine, sorry. Everybody, I'd like to introduce you to Brian Wilson. Thanks for coming on the show today, Brian. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah me too, man. This is a, a topic that's sort of near and dear. You know, I, I find a lot of companies, if they don't manage to get a lot of these things that we're going to talk about nailed, it doesn't matter how good your email templates are or your targeting is or how many appointments you generate, the, the revenue ops is sort of that glue that really holds it all together and helps you convert that sort of activity into closed deals. So That's before right. we ju- before we jump in, I'd love to hear from both of you. How do you define revenue ops? Like what's what's included when you think through, you know, building a world-class lead gen engine? Yeah, I was gonna ask you, Brian. So a lot of companies haven't even gotten sales ops yet. So uh, really, I guess how is, how is revenue ops different or how would you define it? Sure. Yeah, so I, I think um, part of it depends on the, the stage at which your, your company's at, right? But as you, you know, go up market and you start to grow more, you may add on uh, a, a portion of your business where you're going after the channel and marketing's integrated into that and customer success and sales development. And so when I would think of revenue ops, I would think of taking all of those different components and making sure that they're all aligned and integrated, uh, not just siloing sales operations or marketing operations. Gotcha. Hey. Go ahead, Aaron. Yep. Yeah, so, um, when you, when you, what, what size actually do companies, do you think they should start thinking about like this term revenue? Op- I mean, yep. Maybe even sales ops, but, uh, or revenue ops, like are, if we're a million dollar company, is it too late? If, is it too early? Do we need someone who's dedicated? Like, how do I know whether I should care about this? Yep. That's a good question. So, you know, what I would recommend, um, I'm not sure it's too late, certainly, but the, the <laughs> earlier, the better, right? So when, you know, I, I've been in a, uh, sales leadership role for many years, and you're always in those discussions around, all right, how many headcount are we adding? And those are direct revenue generating positions. But I think, you know, when you have those discussions, I would encourage folks to take a step back and think about, okay, if we're going to um, try to achieve the objectives that we're putting out here, there are going to be things that break in the process. And we really need to make sure that we have the support in place, uh, which is typically someone in sales ops or revenue ops to, to make that happen. So I, I would encourage the earlier, the better. Yeah. Uh, how about this? Um, nothing works like uh, a story <laughs> at Moby, right? There's a company you're, you've been helping out. Yep. Maybe walk us through uh, you, when you started with them, where they were. Sure. Uh, how many, maybe how many, including how many people in sales for sort of rough revenue rate, if you can share that, what were the, obvious things you saw that weren't working and what you did. Sure. Uh, just some of the, the highlights of a few of the main changes you made there. Yeah. So, um, idea. yeah, absolutely. So specifically to Moby. So um, some of the challenges uh, that they were having uh, prior to me coming on board was uh, starting at the top of the funnel. So really uh, ramping up their lead generation engine and uh, they didn't really have ownership around revenue operations. So, part of what we've been focused on for the past 60 days is one, we obviously have to get the lead generation engine up and running. And then as we've been doing so, and and as of right now, the results are up 10 X of where they were 60 days ago. But what I would add to that is that as we've uh, begun to add more velocity into the process and we're, we're generating more opportunities, we're finding as we go downstream, there are more and more processes that, we have to add into the business that maybe we, we weren't even thinking about 60 days ago. Yeah. So Actually, let's, that's a good example. Let's just start with that yeah. because you mentioned when you started, there wasn't ownership at Moby over Rev- revenue ops. Yep. Um, so, and you started with the lead gen area. Yep. So who did someone own lead gen or like, what did that look like? Can we say there wasn't ownership? Sure. Yeah. So w- 
specifically around ownership uh, from a revenue operations standpoint. So they've had um, at Moby uh, an outbound sales development team uh, for several years, but there really wasn't that glue to say, okay, um, this group is going to make sure that we are going to be systematic in the way that we handle these things moving forward. Um, so really what I've been able to do is uh, come in and help assist them with that ownership piece, driving the accountability and making sure that, um, to your point, that that glue is there to make sure that this is uh, functioning at scale. Yeah. And you've mentioned, sorry, that 10, they're doing 10 times more that's uh, right. Leads or pipeline generation than a yep. couple months ago. Yeah. Okay. With, with the help of uh, predictable revenue. So uh, shout out there. Yeah. Yeah. They are a customer, which is how we met you. Yeah. Yep. Um, so what was, what were a couple of the main, so question here, the, what were a couple of the main changes that you made um, to first 10 X the results yep. that, we, that we did together? And then I think they'll be different. What are a couple of one or two changes you made to keep the glue there yeah. working? Yeah. So I think the first thing is uh, standardizing the activity model, right? So um, I think that there was ad hoc activity that was happening in sales development, but we really weren't saying, okay, uh, let's reverse engineer the funnel from the top all the way down to the bottom and figure out if we put this in here, here's what we're expecting over here. Let's draw some assumptions, but we have to make sure that, uh, we standardize this um, and uh, make sure that we adhere to it on a daily basis. Yep. Um, as we uh, have gotten further into that, um, there's things that come more downstream, which are, okay, now that we've generated all this activity, we're starting to generate qualified opportunities. We need to have the systems in place to know, okay, what are these conversions? So uh, how many phone calls or how many emails is it taking to generate a qualified opportunity? And after we uh, hold a first meeting, how many of those are converting over to a qualified op? And all of those different uh, conversions as you go through the funnel are things that uh, were not in place, but we're now implementing that and making sure that uh, we can measure that on a daily basis. Yeah. So in other words, um, everyone had their, a different recipe to bake their cakes. Their That's right. Cakes. So helping standardize that. And then yeah. um, were they just, were they tracking any metrics before? Uh, or just a yeah. couple of, you know, very basic ones and not some of the more important ones. Like you said, you know, opportunity. You know, sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to say that there weren't metrics being tracked, but I think yeah. it's just, yeah, it, it's really standardizing that and then holding folks accountable like I said, on a daily or weekly basis to make sure that one, the information is uh, put into uh, the CRM properly. It's standardized amongst the team. So we're all looking at this the same way. Um, and, and so that we, we have that clarity uh, on a more frequent basis. Yeah. Do you use Salesforce or a different? We do. Yeah, okay. we do. What are some of the, you know, the two or three main metrics that you look at around lead gen, uh, at least outbound lead gen right now or, or yeah, we're so tracking the past couple couple months yeah so part of um the weekly process that we're looking for um uh so there's a couple things so one is um we want to see okay how many handoffs are we receiving from sales development over to the closers on mm -hmm. a daily and weekly basis how many of those are turning into a scheduled meeting how many of those are turning into a held meeting and then how many of those are converting over to an op so an easy way that um, we do that right now in Salesforce is we're just, we're logging those uh, as a call task for each one. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'll go into Salesforce and say, okay, um, we have a handoff here and a meeting scheduled here. Uh, we were supposed to have had a held meeting, but we're not showing three call tasks yet in Salesforce. So we really yeah. use that as a, a management tool to stay on top of it and make sure that nothing is uh, slipping through the cracks. Okay. Just, just to dive in a little bit. Sorry, Aaron. Yeah. So Brian, you have call tasks. How do you differentiate just to get super tactical for a second? Yep. How do you differentiate between handoff, you know, accepted? Second I was going to ask the same thing. Is it by subject okay. line? Is it by drop down? Yeah, yeah it, it's a drop down, right? So we have um, a, a drop down. So we'll go in, we'll, we'll hit that log a call button. Um, and then the closer just goes in and says, okay, yep, there's been a handoff. It's occurred um, uh, from this source. Right. And then we just, we really go through each step. Right. So after we schedule a meeting, same thing, you go in, log that done after a meeting is held, same thing, go in, log call, and then update the, in the comments section. 
And so then we can start to really pull all that together. And now we know, especially on a weekly basis, when we sit down and look at this, okay, where are the gaps and uh, make sure that uh, we're maximizing uh, the dollars that we're, we're putting into this and resources. Mm -hmm. Just one more follow on question there. You're log they're logging a call. What object yep. are they logging it on? Is it under the account, the contact, the lead and opportunity? Yeah. In this, in this case, it's on the contact record. Okay. Yep. But, uh, yeah. That's uh, logging activities in the contact, but that would show up. Um, would you have to attach it to the opportunity though, if it's converted? Correct. Yeah. Yep. So the contact and opportunity yep. is an activity. So when you're reporting, are you reporting on the number of activities per, uh, based on the contact model or is it in That's the right. opportunity? Okay. That's right. Cool. Yeah. Cause you can do again, do a tactical, but this is place. I think a lot of people go wrong with like Salesforce and reporting cause you have to get down to this kind of level of detail is you can create a report that way. Um, at least based on show me my SDRs. How many, how many prospectors do you have Brian? Uh, right now, it's we're we're using outsourced resources. Okay, so we're basically we're uh, we're doing the prospecting for you. Yep. Um, but you can look at all right, how many if you had, or if let's say you had one internal too. So if we were doing it yep. for you, or you had one internal, two internal, you can say all right for these sources, um, show me all the activities with these codes for this That's week, right. and you can count it up. And you don't really have to tie it actually to opportunities. Um, cause really you're mostly looking for counts for That's right. Time. Yeah. And, and part of that process too, is when they disposition the held meeting, it'll pop another drop down, and they can say, what was really the, the result of this? Was it not a good fit? Was this a qualified opportunity? And then we can also link those, uh, easily together there too. Okay. So another question. So do you, um, you have that disposition as another drop down in Salesforce? Correct. Or do, yeah. you, uh, do you use a calling tool for those that? Um, so right now we're, we're utilizing from a calling perspective, uh, connect and sell. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, when a held meeting occurs, then there's a trigger to just pop that drop down and say, okay, uh, mark the disposition of this held meeting. Okay. Um, how many salespeople closers are these meetings going to seven or do you, or, or do you have, okay. Yep. So I want to ask a bit now you're starting to transition meetings, um, yep. to them. And have you gotten it? Cause I think you're relatively new here at, sure. the, at the company working. That's right. How much time have you spent on the back end, right? On the, on the, from the, from opportunity or handoff to close in terms of the rev ops and what was going on yep. there you need to change. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So we're, we're just now transitioning into that. So we've implemented some new technology cause these, these folks are uh, out in the field. They're more enterprise reps. So we've added some call recording technology, uh, into the stack to be able to listen in on these calls now and figure out uh, what's happening. We're also scoring out those calls to figure out um, where, where can we improve? Is it, you know, in our, our first call, second call? Um, so, so that's happening now, but okay. Most, okay, uh, I would yeah. say it's early stage. Okay. Actually, no, great questions. Um, is that connect and sell as well? Or you said you're, you're, you're recording calls and you're scoring them. Could you tell us a bit about how and with what? Sure. Yeah. With uh, chorus.ai. It's what we're utilizing right now. Yep. Uh, so. I've heard of, is that a, a call? Is it one of these, is like gongs from these companies that they, that's right. they, they analyze the call recording and they try to interpret it and give you some reports on it? That's exactly right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, I haven't tried it myself, but I don't know. What do you, how does it work in terms of, are you happy with it? I've heard sort of mixed reviews, but of the, of the, that space so far. I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it, it gives you the visibility into, um, you know, obviously hearing what's on the calls and then they're mm -hmm. transcribed. But it, you think of this like six months from now, right, as you're working the sales, um, you know, more, more downstream. Um, if I want to go back, right, to a meeting that we held six months ago and recall exactly, okay, what was discussed early on in this process, I now have a, a tool to be able to do so. So I think mm -hmm. that's where it starts to become uh, helpful in the sales process, but yeah, we're, we're having uh, great success. You can also tag folks on your team, right? So if you notice, Hey, we're hearing a competitor, boom, tag, uh, somebody, uh, at, at that part of the, of the call. Yep. Uh, so, and similarly, you mentioned then you score the calls. Is that yep. done through chorus or do you do in more of a manual? It's step? more of a manual process today. That's right. 
what do you, so actually now this is something really interesting. Like what are you scoring? What does that look like? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, are we establishing an agenda up front? Are we, are we building rapport? Are we finding out what their needs and challenges are? It's, it's just a lot of your standard sales uh, 101 things. But what we're trying to do is make sure, okay, on those discovery calls, if we're going to have all this investment, right, to get someone uh, on the phone and, and get in front of them, we want to make sure that we're, we're maximizing that and be able to coach and, and refine off of that. Yep. Um, so calls are one area that you've, you focused on. Is yep. there a second area that you're, that you're really working on on the, on the closure side? Um, or is the call is really you know, sort of eighty percent? You know, most of what you're working on. At this yeah, point? for the for the most part. Yeah, that's that's what we're working on. Okay. Uh, all seven are remote. Um, how do you, you know, working with a bunch of remote salespeople is challenging. Yep. So especially when you're newer, you don't have relationships. How yep. are you? You know, again, you come in. Let's say you're coming in RevOps. You've got a bunch of these remote salespeople who may or may not yep. know you, and you want to make changes and. Yep. What do you think has been worked for you to either get to know them or build trust or uh, relationships and sort of help them embrace changes? Sure. Yeah, I, I think um, that's a great question. So obviously, I, I got a chance to meet a lot of these folks face to face, which was helpful um, to establish some of that trust. But um, I think the key is, uh, you know, when I, when I came on board, we said, okay, here is what we're, we're, we're going to do. We're going to help you. We're going to ramp up our lead generation model. Um, but that being said, there will be additional tasks and responsibilities that we're asking of everyone on this team. Um, but you're going to see some benefit from that, right? So, uh, and, and we've delivered on that. So um, I think the credibility and trust is there now that we've been able to deliver and help these folks. So it makes it a little bit easier conversation to come back to them and say, Hey, we have to get this updated. This isn't right. We need to make sure this is in line uh, yeah. because here's, we're helping Here's out. all these this extra work and sales force you need to do. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. Exactly. Um, so let's step back a bit. If you're, if you're, let's say there's someone listening who is in sales or rev ops yep. or someone who wants to hire someone to do that or yep. retask someone to do that. All right. So I'm, I want to figure this out. I'm, I'm new. Um, sort of where would I, how would you advise someone who's new to either a situation or new to the role to get started? Yeah, that's a good, yeah, good question. So um, I would start with asking the question, you know, what, what's the goal, right? What are we actually out here to, to, to try to achieve and then start to reverse engineer that goal and figure out, um, everything that's going to need to happen. So if I, if I'm going to uh, advise somebody, I'm, I'm going to say, okay, let's start with a goal and then let's move into a gap analysis to figure out, um, how do we operate today? What systems are we utilizing? What are the, what are the results that those systems are producing today? Uh, are there any r redundancies or overlaps or, or, uh, leakage that, that we can, uh, address immediately? Uh, but I think those are the things that you want to get out in front of. I think another one too, when you think about sales and, and sales uh, development. By the way too, I would throw in there because you yeah. mentioned it's already like put some effort into building relationships with the That's right. people on the sales team. That's right. If, they, if there's no relationship, it's going to be a lot harder for them to, they're just not going to listen or care as much. And That's true. If they know you and what you're trying to do, then they're going to be more receptive. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point too. And, and we've seen this too with sales development teams. Go in and, and analyze and try to identify repetitive tasks, right? So things where there are- List building. Uh, yeah, right, that, too many clicks, I'm having to copy and paste. I, you know, if you can help pre-populate, if you can use some type of API to feed information over to them and make their lives easier, you're gonna build a lot of uh, uh, trust and credibility there out of the gate. Yeah. Is this something someone can do part time? Do they need to be full time? How how big does the company? How big does the sales team have to be before you need like a dedicated person? Sure. Is that there's a lot of these companies who are probably on the transition of either we can't hire a full time person or we don't right. have one or do we invest there versus you know, like a salesperson? How so are those kinds of trade offs? Yeah, and I don't. I, you, I don't know if it's a one size fits all, right? I mean, there, yeah, there's really going to be big. different scenarios. And, um, 
Yeah, I, I think you could utilize part-time resources depending on, uh, again, what, what's the goal, right? So if, if we're trying to uh, 4X sales this year, okay, we know that there could be a lot more velocity that is being added into the business and this could be a full-time person we've got to have. Well, if we're a business and we're trying to grow 5%, um, there may not be as much velocity and, 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 and as many moving parts and complexity. You might be able to get away with some, some part-time assistance. Yeah. Um, if I'm hiring or managing someone, like what am I looking for in terms of how do I know, uh, is there a metric I'm looking for for them? Is it, how do I know if I have someone with confidence or if the, maybe I made a mishire? Or be some clues either way. Yeah, I mean, I think early on you're going to want, you're going to want to test really how analytical is this person, right? And I can tell you just from experience with uh, sales or, or revenue ops, I'm looking for individuals that they are going to be proactive, so they're going to understand. Okay, here are the goals that we know that we're trying to achieve, uh, but they're going to be proactive in in seeing those gaps and seeing that leakage and be able to bubble that up and say, hey, Brian, um, here's what I'm noticing over here. I know this is the conversion rate that we're, we're expected at this portion of the funnel. Just wanna make sure that you're aware of this so that this, this might be something that uh, some folks uh, on the leadership team take a look at. So if you're, if you're not seeing those types of things early on, um, th there could be challenges there. So in other words, if you feel like you have to hold their hands and point them, uh, I always point them towards what to do, then you got the wrong person, at least yeah. as, a, as a first person there. That's a good way of putting it. And if they're not managed into the dashboard, then another red flag for you. Yep. And what's yep. probably like the thing that most companies miss around this area or uh, whether it's a company or team? Yeah, I, I would say in my experience, it's documentation, right? So in, in taking that a step deeper, it's, um, more specifically around updating that documentation, right? So there, there's nothing worse than, uh, it's like, ah, uh. yeah, you know, I'm a new SDR. I get into the role and okay. We updated this seven months ago and there's been three changes since then in the process. Right. And I, I'm a new SDR. I'm excited. I'm sitting down, I'm getting ready to do this work. And Oh, why, why isn't this working? I'm, I'm following exactly what you gave me. Oh, well, we forgot to update that. So yeah. Um, I think that's something to keep a close eye on. And then um, I would also encourage, uh, especially sales leaders that are listening in, that when that documentation is uh, being created, a lot of sales or revenue ops folks haven't sold or haven't been in that uh, type of environment. So think about your end user and how they want to consume information. So lots of screenshots, lots of pictures, and reduce the complexity, not only in the process, but in the documentation. In other words, don't write a dense text heavy manual. Yeah, they're not gonna read it. The 50 right? page manual. That's right. Yep. That's right. Uh, that plus, you know, like people just don't, it's just, you can't rely on people to study stuff on their own, have right. live, you know, conversations and live teaching sessions. And so. Sure. Yeah, people, the, the whole like online education and the study when you want to is, is a non-existent reality. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Totally agree. Brian, I'd love your, your point of view, just to sort of go back um, a couple steps back. It was, it was something that we sort of, we, we touched on, but we didn't go as deep. And I think you've got a really great sort of framework or checklist in your mind about when you first step in and take over a team, what yep. are the, like, so you've got a sort of systematic a sort of order operations of like, here's yep. where I, you know, here are the things I look at. This is what I do first. And here's sort of the, my checklist. Can you, yep. can you walk me through like, what is that sort of first layer? I guess, I think you said, you mentioned it started with the goal. Yep. What are we trying That's to achieve right. here? Then, yep. then what's, what's next and what sort of follows after? Take yeah. us like top to bottom. Sure. Yeah. Top to bottom, uh, next would be that, that gap analysis, right? So figure out um, how are we operating today? Um, what systems are we utilizing? And when, when we say systems, that could be tech, but it's also just the processes that we, we utilize internally. Um, and, and are we utilizing those uh, systems properly? 
what have been the historical results that they are uh, uh, achieving today, um, and uh, what, what systems aren't working, right? So go in and let's start to figure out, okay, maybe we need to change this. Maybe we need to better optimize this. So those some, some examples could be uh, what's our data management process or what are the different workflows that we're utilizing within salesforce.com or alerts and triggers and uh, how do we uh, define our leads and a lot, a lot of those more tactical specific items. But uh, I would say that's um, more top to bottom. And then after you get that baseline established, um, when I'm having a discussion with uh, a revenue ops leader, it's I'm really looking for uh, three things out of them. The first one being uh, I'm looking for innovation, right? So when we think of innovation in this space, operationally, it's um, process optimization, right? So how can we improve this? Think about how we operate today. How can we make it better? Can, can you give me an example just before you move on? Because yep. like, it sounds like a, a great thing to do, but like, can you give me, give me an example of a time when you've, you've looked at a, at a process and be like, hey, we can optimize this so we can find a way to innovate here? Yeah, I, in, it, maybe innovate isn't even the right word because a lot of times it's something very juvenile, but it's still a process uh, improvement. So it's little things like, hey, when a handoff occurs, make sure that these folks uh, are alerted over here as opposed to these folks. Or uh, on these scenarios, we need to make sure that uh, we're firing this trigger and, and this report needs to go out, right? So that's just a very basic example. But uh, the, the second thing uh, I would look for out of that team is just the ongoing maintenance, right? So things, as you speed this up, things are going to break. No. Um, <laughs> it's inevitable, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and in the sales development world, you're, you're moving so fast uh, if you lose even a couple of hours, it has a, a, a very large impact on the end result. So um, it, it's, it's chaos, right? And you need to get that chaos uh, corrected as quickly as possible. And then lastly, um, if I'm having that discussion, I want to make sure that that uh, revenue ops leader understands that uh, at the end of the day, we have to measure all of this, right? So how are we trending versus our targets and these changes that we're uh, implementing into the business, uh, are they having a material impact on the end result, which has to come back to really four things. Is it more opportunities in the pipeline? Are we driving our deal size up? Are we winning more deals? And are we re reducing our sales cycle length? So if you can frame your mind around the decisions that we're making around those four things, mm -hmm. um, that keeps us focused. Beautiful. It sounds like you almost need to map it out into like, I could see this mapped out into a quadrant of some sort, like, okay, these are all the, the different things that we're going to try and the innovations or things that we need to, yep. to improve. I'll draw one up and send it to you. I'd, I'd <laughs> love to see that. Yeah. I think this belongs in a, in a, a big old Brian Wilson, you know, sort of checklist. Give me a binder. There you, you know? go. <laughs> so we've gone through our checklist. You sort of map out from a high level. If I'm just sort of summarizing everything we've talked about today, yep. you, you sort of mapping out your activity model or you're figuring, yep. sorry, you figure out what the goal is, yep. right? Then we map out our activity model. Then we're going through sort of the data management, your workflows, your lead definitions, lead management, op management, yep. identifying repetitive tasks, looking for common issues, bottlenecks, backlogs, and then you're implementing systems for sort of continuously improving the process, um, maintaining things in case, you know, somebody changes a report or an integration and things break. So you've yeah. got something to keep the process moving forward. You've got a layer in there to make sure that nothing's breaking. Um, and then you've got your measurement layer in. So how are we trending against our target to make sure that, you know, everything that you're doing is in service of creating new ops, um, improving the average deal size, bringing up the win rate and shortening that sales cycle. That's right. Cool. And the biggest thing everybody's missing is documentation. Um, Brian, Aaron, what are we missing here? I feel like we've, we've learned, learned so much in such a short period of time. It's good. I'm glad, um, you know, I, I, I never get tired of actually diving into some of those specific questions on like, how do you log tasks in Salesforce? So you get the right <laughs> reports on your, you know, up, uh, handoffs scheduled and held calls. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, I just, uh, by the way, too, I just find there's a lot of, uh, it's harder than people realize to get accurate outbound dashboards. And those are some of those little details that help you do that. Mm -hmm. yep. Brian, I, I think I've got one last question for you. Sure, um, sure. I know we've, we've talked a lot. Okay. Maybe, maybe two. Um, but can you give me an example of a company um, or just maybe let's wrap it up with a story of, you know, we started with, you know, the story at Moby and all the things that you, you brought in. Um, can you give me an example of a company um, that had really nailed revenue ops and, you know, sh sort of paint me a picture of what was the before and the before and after? Yeah, sure. So uh, company that I was with um, you know, a couple years back that, that helped, uh, we really didn't have any of this structured, right? So we didn't, even at, when we first started, we didn't have sales development. We didn't have rev ops or literally none of this existed, but uh as we grew, we, we did add these different layers. And, and I would say that, um, you know, sales and, and revenue ops is something that uh, in that case, we, we started with, okay, let's just add more, one, one more piece, one more piece, one more piece, right? So you're, you're building an engine, right? And over time, uh, we, we did so and, and grew the enterprise value of the company by two and a half X. And it's been a great story over there. But uh, yeah, to your point, we're, we're doing the same thing here at Moby now. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a super, super critical uh, portion of the business. The other thing I would mention too is, um, you know, and I think Phil Keen, uh, who was on one of your prior episodes, yeah. he, he released yeah. something at Costello uh, a week or two ago about there's $12 billion right now being invested into sales and marketing acceleration this is going to only continue to get more and more important um, because things are just speeding up more and more. Mm -hmm. I think somebody compared it the other day to sort of, you know, driving around a formula one track and, and either having everything welded together or being held together by a rope and duct tape. Mm. You know, it's like, I'd, I'd rather be the guy with the car who's, you know, being or joints are welded as opposed to held yep. together by rope. Yep. Cause once you start going, once you start picking up speed, yeah, things are going to start to come apart. I want to press you on this grew the enterprise value of the company by two and a half by yep. 2.5 X. What, what can you give me, give us some examples, some more like some, can, if you can share um, some sure. concrete examples of like, what did that look like in terms of the, I don't know, number, number of meetings, booked, number of sales or sales value or sorry, sales, um, new revenue created there. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I'll, I can go into specific uh, revenue numbers, but what I can yeah. tell you is that prior to, um, uh, you know, us implementing a lot of this, there really wasn't any outbound activity at all. And then um, I think in, in the first year we booked uh, s between six and 700 meetings from our outbound process uh, on an annual basis in the, in the enterprise. Um, so uh, yeah, had a very significant impact on, on our end result. Mm -hmm. Six or 700 meetings up from how many the, the year previous? Uh, not very many. Yeah, not very many. Very <laughs> insignificant number. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, um, I'll tell you too. I mean, um, when we started down that journey, we weren't really thinking about sales or, or revenue operations. Like I was guilty of it too, right? You, you just want to go and then you start to, you get into this and you're like, oh, wow, that just broke. Oh, well, okay. How, how are we going to correct this quickly? Uh, and you need resources and you need experts that can um, uh, dissect this and, and, and help you uh, correct it. Cool. La last two questions on this. What, yep. was the, what was the size of the team that you had to generate uh, that many meetings? Uh, started with one, right? And we grew it to four. Four guys yep. generating four that many four. meetings. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. It's like a 10 to 15 per, per one per month. Well, uh, those were qualified meetings. So those are meetings that then after that had to be qualified. Um, so yeah, th those were meetings held. And then I would say of those, you're finding 55, 60% were converted yeah. to qualified. 50, yeah. So still solid. Mm -hmm. yep. That's fantastic. And how long did it take you to, to get there? Well, you know, I think in the, in the early days, it was a little sluggish, right? Cause you're just trying to figure it out. You're just trying to bring all this together. But, um, after you get into a rhythm and you can start to figure out, okay, when we, uh, have this input over here, here's the output. That's when, you know, okay, 
let's add another body. Let's add another body in order to ramp this up and, and really get after it. Mm -hmm. It's a rough timeline. We're talking, you did this in three weeks two, or two, more like three half, or four yeah, years? Two and a half years. Okay. Yeah, two and a half years. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and last piece, any advice for somebody who might currently be in that sort of just trying to figure it out phase and hasn't quite made it through to those like breakthrough numbers that you were producing? Yeah. Step one, read predictable revenue. That's what I would tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so get your, get your arms wrapped around that. But I mean, I, I, there is tons and tons of information online now about, you know, rev ops, sales ops. And, and also you can uh, go into uh, your network and find folks that are experts and trained on salesforce.com and they understand these systems. That's how I learned a lot of this is just get with those folks, ask them tons of questions, watch what they do. Uh, and you can start to uh, absorb a lot of uh, that into your repertoire. So read books, listen to podcasts, reach out to the people on those podcasts and ask them questions. So how can people find you? Uh, you could find me uh, online, I guess on LinkedIn. Um, you know, Brian Wilson. Uh, cool. At Moby. Beautiful. That's M-O-B-I, wireless management. That's right. If you're trying to find them, not, not the singer or uh, songwriter. <laughs> Brian, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate thanks it. Felt like I learned, learned a ton, man. Yeah, yeah appreciate thanks. it. Thanks for having me on, guys.